Good evening, everybody. My name is Dave Carger. I am a correspondent at the Today Show and IMDb, and was that a magical film or what? It was so much fun to watch it with this audience. You guys are unbelievable. And what a pleasure it is to bring out four of the people who brought this movie to the screen. First, I want to introduce one of the film's producers. Please welcome Fred Berger. Here's the two guys you already met earlier this evening. The composer, Justin Hurwitz. And the writer-director, Damien Chazelle. And please welcome the star of La La Land, Emma Stone. Hi guys. Okay, so Damien, how exactly does one decide that they're gonna shut down the ramp to a freeway in Los Angeles? Where did well, this come from? Luckily I have my producer here who can, yes. also, who can also help with that because it was a little bit of a logistical nightmare. It's very easy to, you know, uh, to kind of write down on a page that <laughs> that uh, you know this big musical number happens on a freeway, but figuring out how to actually do it was obviously a different a different thing. Um, I mean, what we wound up doing was was there's a uh, uh, an easy pass ramp uh, connecting the 105 and the 110 oh. um, that you know is just for those lucky few with easy passes. <laughs> so uh, so we were able to shut that down specifically just that elevated ramp for a weekend and uh, we just packed it with cars. Um, and, and Mandy Moore, our choreographer, uh, uh, packed it with dancers. And, uh, and we, yeah, and we, and we just sort of went in and did it. But I think part of what was fun about, you know, it was very important to all of us to do it on a real location and not have it be done, you know, uh, uh, with green screen or on a sound stage. Um, so, you know, that creates all sorts of problems obviously there was a heat wave when we shot it you know there's went high winds up there so the camera on the crane is like doing this and the ramp is slanted also it's not a flat ramp so you you know that kind of creates all sorts of problems for dancing and camera framing um and uh, the truck door when we needed it to open at the kind of midpoint of the number decided of course to just not open and just break <laughs> so we had to like figure out a pulley system to like time so that when the guy seemed like he was opening it it would open so all these things, you know, kind of happen that are headaches in the moment, but you do, I think, get something visceral out of just being actually on there and looking down and seeing actual traffic going and all that stuff was that kind of element I wanted to make sure was in the scene. Fred, what did the city say to you when you explained this idea to them? They said, how much can you pay? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually, that's, that specific ramp's been used uh, several times, Transformers and other movies, so we knew we'd have access to it if we'd had the resources. But as Damien said, there was something just extra visceral about actually being on location, having traffic that you see on the movie in all the other ramps beneath you. You have 360 views of the entire city. It was definitely the two best days of shooting, I think, of our lives. I mean, just having that, uh, that control of that kind of location. And the cars were all selected by Damien by color and by size and everything about it was, you know, what's crazy is we were shooting on film as well. So the way the monitors look, you can't actually tell if you're getting it because it's so much little detail in each scene. So we didn't really know we had it until two days later. Oh my God, that must have been stressful when you like um, push play on. But the it was it was a joy. Yeah. Um, how on earth do you even try to rehearse that? How do you find a space that approximates that ramp so that your dancers can plan it all with cars? I mean, it's crazy. It, it was uh, you know it's. Um, that really was actually one of the biggest challenges was just was adapting to the real location in not a lot of time because uh, yeah it's not a thing you can rehearse on location uh, for most for the most part we rehearsed in parking lots uh, I think Mandy started off by rehearsing dancers in her dance studio I remember with just like apple boxes you know <laughs> representing you know car one car two truck um, 
whenever we would go over the camera moves with the, you know, for the crew and everything, just for simplicity to actually be able to map out the, the, the diagram of camera movement, we had like a model, you know, of the freeway ramp filled with Hot Wheels toy cars, <laughs> and, that, you know, and that became our, and we'd like label each one, this is the flamenco dancer, this is the BMX biker, this is dancer number one. And so all of this is kind of in theory, you know, you get that down as much as you can, but you know that there's going to be this big leap once you're actually on location. Um, luckily, Fred was able to, uh, 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 along with our AD, Peter Cohn, was able to kind of carve out a moment in the schedule where we could go to the location, shut it down just briefly on a Saturday the week before, and just do a little bit of a dress rehearsal just to kind of test out things. Uh, naturally, that dress rehearsal was a disaster. <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it was exactly the disaster we needed at that moment to kind of figure out, okay, this is what's working, this is what's not working. We changed the crane of, of the camera, we adapted some of the choreography, we made little nips and tucks, and then by the time we actually could go in and shoot the real thing, we at least had some idea of what to expect. Justin, how did it work from your end? You know, the songs and the story just fit so beautifully and seamlessly together. Is that because the two of you worked together so closely on it, or was it a question of, fitting songs into specific beats of the story or fitting a story around songs that were written? Yeah, we started working at the same time around uh, six years ago. Damien was writing the treatment and then script and I started composing at the same time. And, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the key moments uh, it, that are in this movie were in the very, very first versions of the treatment. Um, so we just started talking about what are the really important moments and what are the really important themes that this movie needs. And actually, I started with the instrumental theme, uh, the theme of the movie that we call Mia and Sebastian's theme. That was the first thing we wanted to tackle because it's so... Uh, you know, it's so emotionally integral to what the story is. That's the waltz that recurs? The waltz that recurs that you see Ryan play at the piano and then comes back in the score many times. And b before we even started on songs, we started with that theme because we, you know, it's, it carries us through sequences like the planetarium and it's, you know, it has narrative importance and a lot of emotional importance. So we started there. And then, yeah, we, just based on, you know, s story points and sort of where Damien saw songs or instrumental musical numbers or other sequences that needed, you know, music. Again, he had such a complete vision of it, you know, even at, at, the, f at the first stages of the, the script that he knew even where score would go. So we started... Uh, talking about the song will go here, score will go there. In the case of a song, this is what narratively, emotionally, it's supposed to accomplish. Um, and I just started composing, you know, melodies and themes, and we started, you know, picking them. Uh, it was a long process in, before we found the right melodies and themes, but, you know, just started picking them, choosing which moments they'd go in, and, you know, structuring them into songs, verse, chorus, what, whatnot. And then once we felt like they were locked musically, then we would hand them off to the incredibly talented lyricists, uh, Pasek and Paul, Benj Pasek and Justin Paul, who wrote all the gorgeous words. So great. There's a number of scenes in the movie that come across to me as like total high wire acts. I mean, obviously the opening is one where just so many things have to go right. I'm also thinking about that great kind of magic hour dance sequence, you know, that you and Ryan share. How stressful is that when it's such a long shot in this magic hour period? And maybe there's some digital stuff going on where you can make the sky whatever color you want, or maybe that's you had to do it in a short amount of time. But God forbid you made a mistake four minutes into a take. Do you just like, oh, all right, that's it. You gotta start over? Or do you go through the whole thing and then just start again? We, um, we started rehearsing that, I mean, months before we shot it. And um, we would rehearse in a dance room and, and you know work on this and Mandy would learn our strengths or our, uh, you know, sometimes weaknesses, maybe like for Ryan <laughs> specifically. Um, I could do everything. Um, <laughs> but so we would, she would sort of reshape it and, you know, we realized my character's wearing heels in that scene, so what are we gonna do? And so she kind of added this really sweet moment where I have the bag and we change into flats and, um, and that was all kind of integrated. And then we would go on Saturdays to Griffith and they would give us a, a section for a couple hours where we were gonna shoot and it's on a hill with potholes and 
all of that. So it's different, you know, in a dance room than it is on that hill. Um, and so we rehearsed that for months and then we had two days to shoot it, an hour each day oh. at Magic Hour, which they roughly found was about five takes if we like finished, wiped off our sweat and then ran back to the bottom and did it again. Oh and second take of the second day, I think yeah. you used. Um, but it was at that point, yeah, we, I mean, I think I fell off a bench, the bench. Didn't I step down and back up? Or was that Ryan? That was De probably Ryan. Ryan. <laughs> Definitely, Definitely Ryan. Definitely Ryan. Yeah, it was Ryan. So Ryan, <laughs> bless him, is, he's learning. He tries. He, he tries. tries. He tries. And um, so he messed up, but, so they couldn't use it. But uh, no, it was, thankfully at that point we had rehearsed enough and really, you know, had gone for it enough that there, were, there was nothing too catastrophic. Fred, as the producer, are you like, oh, time is money? You know, like, if these people mess up, then what are we going to do? What are you thinking? Yeah, I was really angry at Ryan that day. No. Uh, no, it was the, actually the opposite. It was, there was a certain pleasure and familial kind of camaraderie that came from the level of ambition that this movie had, uh, sort of at all levels. Just the idea from, you know, as Justin said six years ago, to make an original romantic musical about a city that most people outside of LA don't like was already kind of a crazy idea. <laughs> so from that spirit, we just said, why don't we just make it harder and harder on ourselves at every level? And I remember the day that, just, that uh, Damien and our cinematographer, Lena Sangren, came back and Linus is this tall Swedish man who's just so excited about everything and his catchphrase is, wouldn't it be cool, which is another way of saying it, let's make this 10 times harder on everybody. Um, and they're like, let's, if we see night, it has to be magic hour. I was like, so we have half an hour to shoot all the single take musical numbers that have to go perfectly. Great. Um, but what it brought out was a certain athleticism of the entire crew. And when we watched that scene, the thing that's always missing from us is the 200 people screaming and cheering when they finish and that it went well uh, in the dailies that we, you know, it, was, it felt like a concert or a sporting match every day because the bar was raised so high that people brought their A games. And it felt like we kind of had to nail those. And it was, you rarely get that on a movie set. And it sort of felt like the dialogue scenes were harder because we relaxed in a weird way. Right. And the, and the, 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 one, the one quick thing I would just jump in uh, to add to what Fred was saying is, is your, Fred is like the, the one, I, the only producer I've ever worked with who, who would legitimately, you know, like if I'd done a, a, a few takes of something and I was feeling kind of, you know, pressure on time or whatever, uh, you know, he would sort of take me to the side and go, just do as many, like, don't tell anyone I'm telling you this, but just do as many takes as you want. We'll find the money, but just don't, don't tell me. Just do, go, do more. And I'd go, okay, like go that. again. <laughs> and uh, that's just like, that to me is like, yeah, it's the, I mean, as a filmmaker, it's the best thing to hear ever. It's actually, you know, the rarity that the, the you know, he actually pushed me more than, than I even would have pushed myself in many of those instances. And, and, uh, and yeah, so thanks, Brad. Very nice of you to say, Damien. I remember day one, I will say, we shot the roommate's interior single take number and they just were so well rehearsed that Emma and her, the roommates nailed it immediately. And we, we wrapped two hours early and I pulled Damien aside and said, don't you ever do that again. <laughs> <laughs> just keep shooting. <laughs> Emma, the audition scenes are just so cringeworthy. Uh, it's, it's just crazy. But I would imagine that they must ring true to you, when you think back to back in the days when you had the audition, um, are there, are, do you think like, do you remember situations like that that were just so incredibly awkward in an audition? Yes, definitely. I mean, I think the ones that I remember the most are kind of the one where she gets the call back and then it's just the cut off immediately, the, yeah. the like, thank you for coming in, okay. That is a pretty frequent experience, I think, for many auditioning actors that they're, they know right away they're not going to use you so they just let you go and you've prepared for a long time and it's pretty heartbreaking and then the scene at the beginning not to bring it back to ryan but <laughs> the one in the beginning was ryan's actual experience because damien was asking us and he was like all right you guys come on let's be cathartic let's make it productive what were your worst auditions and ryan had this this story about him crying in the middle of a you know an audition like doing a monologue and a, a phone rang on the table and the casting director answered the phone in the middle of him crying and had a conversation and then hung up and was like continue 
And he was like, well, do I keep cry crying? What, what am I supposed to do? Um, so that was kind of a, a variation on that actual real life story that but happened, of course, to Ryan. Like, that's never happened to me. Right. It's so crazy. <laughs> like, it's always come really well, actually. I don't remember anything <laughs> bad. But there's so many layers to that because that scene also has to get across to the audience that Mia is quite a good actress that, and has the talent. So that must be hard. You, you had to do a good job acting as if you're a good actress. That was kind of something, yeah, we had a, we had a lot of discussions about that too. Like how, you know, at the beginning, if you can feel that there's something to this, you know, that there needs to be something to this, this woman that she's been, you know, doing this and that she has something to give in that way and really, you know, um, but then also it was kind of fun because later on the idea of the callback scene was meant to feel very forced and pushed. Like there was a lot of, you know, stuff on top of her. And I think he was, you know, Damien was amazing about kind of calibrating that so you could feel that it's not just like every audition she's nailing and people are being dismissive of her. It's sometimes, you know, not going well at all because she's putting way too much pressure on herself. Damien, this is your third movie as a director. Of course, I'm sure a lot of people here saw your last one, Whiplash with J.K. Simmons. I totally wanted more J.K. Simmons in this movie. I'm just gonna say that, but that's okay. Um, but if there's one thing that your three movies have in common, of course, it's jazz. What's that about? <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it's, it's per, you know, it's, it's, it's just this personal, I guess, connection I have to the music, probably m mainly from growing up. You know, my my uh, my dad is French, and he moved to America, you know, for work, but also I think in large part because he, growing up, was so obsessed with 20th century American music, um, particularly jazz. So growing up, uh, there was jazz playing in the house all the time, and he would be telling me, you know, some of the stories that Ryan tells Emma in the movie, or that J.K. tells Miles in Whiplash about whether it was Charlie Parker or Sidney Bechet or Dexter Gordon or whoever. And so I grew up uh, kind of mythologizing jazz, uh, started playing it pretty young, uh, got really into it. So I, it's, it's, uh, I don't have a better answer than that in a way than, than it was kind of there at the outset for me. Um, and uh, I remember when I met Justin, we, you know, we met a uh, freshman year of college playing in a, not a jazz group, it was like a rock band. We thought we'd be rock stars, and it didn't didn't really pan out. But we but we talked, uh, uh, you know, very early on. Uh, well, two things we bonded over. One, we bonded over movies, and kind of that's quickly how we decided that we would do movies together, and and because uh, he wanted to do movies, uh, music for movies. Mm. But he also, you came from a classical background, I came from a jazz background, and so I think the same time I was turning Justin on to Coltrane, he was turning me on to Bach and, you know, Tchaikovsky, and, and, and I feel like that's actually at least where a lot of this movie lives, is in, you know, at least to, to my ears, what Justin was doing here was really taking a lot of that jazz language, um, also a certain kind of pop sensibility as well in the songwriting, and then orchestrating it like, uh, you know, like, uh, like Tchaikovsky or WC or something like that. Justin, given the fact that you guys work so closely together, how much time, if at all, did you spend on the set? Oh, I was on the set uh, every any day there was music, which was most days, because between the songs and Ryan's jazz and trying to make sure Ryan wouldn't screw up the jazz too much, because he's screwing up everything, you know, keep in mind. <laughs> It's really, but he's such a nice person. Yeah, it's but, really nice as a person. But just, which is great. It's important too. Um, no, I mean, joking aside, he was uh, the, the work Ryan did was ridiculous. He was in piano lessons six days a week uh, for months leading up to this. Um, so everything was like a well-oiled machine. But it was just good to be there and lend an eye, um, and sort of have you know a sort of a musical opinion, you know, when, when things needed it. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, there were two songs that were sung live on set. So Emma's song, Audition, oh Fools Who Dream, she sang that completely live. Please. Um, yes. And uh, in the City of Stars duet. Uh, also completely live. So yeah, they, that, those were songs where, they act, where Ryan and Emma just sort of drove the songs. And um, I was in the other room playing piano kind of into their ears on an electric keyboard and letting them just guide the song. And uh, they'd both, you know, rehearsed it quite a bit in the, in the you know, leading up, leading up to the shoot just to get the notes, to get the, to figure out the keys with them and to sort of get it in their bones. But I think they were, 
you know, Emma can talk about this, but I think they were kind of saving themselves and, you know, particularly with audition kind of, you know, saving it for the day to really go to the place emotionally mm. where you went. So it was a new experience on the day and we didn't know what it was going to be. Um, and seeing, you know, that performance to see it, you know, acted the way she acted it and just to be there to sort of accompany it was really kind of an unbelievable experience. You must have had that date circled on your calendar, like <laughs> date where I'm going to be shooting audition. Yes, definitely. And how did you psych yourself up for it? Um, I think it was just, I just knew it was coming. I mean, we had, I worked with a wonderful voice teacher named Eric Vitro. They set me up with him for the movie and, um, and he was so helpful and we just rehearsed and rehearsed with Marius and, um, and then we did, I think, I always say nine takes and I think that's correct. Wow. I I'm, not, I'm not sure, but I, I do remember it was actually one of the early takes that, oh, really? uh, that I think we used yeah. in the movie. I just did the others. So I just kept singing. Exhaust you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. cool, cool. <laughs> um, no, it's, but it's that kind of thing, like what Fred was saying. You know, sometimes you, especially shooting film, you know, we, and, and with the budget we had, we knew we didn't have really the budget for reshoots in any real way. So we would always try, kind of our rule of thumb was to try to get two, like for any of the long takes, to try to do two, one, two, you know, make sure we had at least two that we felt like, okay, we got it, that can be in the movie. Uh, so two perfect takes. Um, but I do think the take we used of yours was actually, which I guess makes sense, it was one of the rawest and it was, it was early on, maybe take two, take three, something like that. Fred, how did you guys know that John Legend could act so well? Because he's great. He is great, isn't he? This is the first time he's ever acted in a movie. Um, that's a really good question. I don't, I don't know that that was the, the sort of threshold. I mean, he's so charismatic and has such presence. And Damien sat down with him a few times. And we, everything in this movie sort of started as, wouldn't it be amazing if we had actors like Ryan and Emma in this movie? Okay, so we're not going to get them, so let's see who we can get. And, you know, six years ago, we did a little rip reel that Damien cut together. And it's all of them. And they were the sort of pinnacle. And then somehow... We suckered them into doing the movie. And John Legend was sort of the same thing. It's like we knew we wanted someone from the music world who had this natural charisma and also had a musical talent who could feel, you know, he has to convince Ryan to do something against his own instincts, but you don't want him to be a villain. And John has that natural charm and sincerity and can also speak to being a jazz musician and to the, to the roots. But also I think he delivers that speech about moving the, the medium and the music form forward in a way that is uniquely him. Um, and then he sat down with Justin and our music team and in two hours they were just supposed to meet and hang out and talk and just get to know each other and see if they could collaborate and after two hours they came out with Start a Fire, that Echo song. And it was so damn good and so perfect sort of narratively for what the movie had to be, which is just good enough that you believe Ryan's character would play it, but just bad enough that you would believe that Emma would be pissed at him for doing it. Um, <laughs> And then we had to cast him because he had the song. So, uh, but no, he, he really did the work and he's just part of the family and was uh, just an amazing guy in every way. And Emma, I'm so intrigued by, well, there's two moments that really get me with your performance. One is when you're sitting at the dinner with Finn Whitrock and, uh, and, and figuring out that you need to get out of there. And there's so much going on in your face and your body language. But then also in that scene that Fred's talking about where you're in the audience, and there's a whole story being told on your face. But it can't have just been Mia reacts in a little bit of horror at this music she's seeing. It had to have been more choreographed than that, almost like a dance, all the different things that were gonna go on in your facial expression. What was that like, the preparation for it? It's the other way. <laughs> we found the fault, we found the fault. Am I, am I alive? <laughs> um, <laughs> the, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Uh, I'm trying, well, I'm trying to remember the, the kind of, do you, I, I mean, I, it, I guess there wasn't actually, I don't remember there being actually that much kind of uh, preparation specifically for, like in a way, I think you just intuitively got it. I think in the mm -hmm. script it was written, you know, as especially that scene where, the, the latter scene, the John Legend uh, scene, you know, the, the various degrees were kind of written out in the description of, you know, Mia first is shocked, then kind of tries to enjoy it, realizes this is fun, and then it starts to get a little more, then suddenly it's a little more produced and dancers are showing up and it's just becoming less and less Sebastian. And 
Um, but I don't know how much we actually, I mean, it's yeah, again, I it's a, that's, uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember how much we actually talked through. I mean, I know on the, on the speaker, you know, it was very much like, and the song is beginning, but that uh, beyond that, I don't know that you were like shouting out. I mean, one, um, one great thing on the, in the, I remember in the restaurant scene was, uh, that was kind of lovely to do because that was another instance of having Justin, in that case, not another room, but just kind of around the corner in the restaurant playing a piano. So essentially what you're hearing, you know, in that scene is what was being played live on the set. So Emma could really react to that. And then when she ran out, we blasted the score from speakers. Yeah, running down the street. In, in, and that actually, that's a really great point. In both of those scenes that you talk about, there are these big sweeping kind of musical situations going on. And I was hearing the music that whole time. And you sometimes hear about actors. I don't know if you guys have heard about, there are some actors that are like, have been in it for a while. And they wear an earwig in the middle of scenes. Have you heard of this? There's some, uh, May, prominent actors that I guess listen to music while they're shooting scenes in films. <laughs> and um, you've heard of this, Fred, right? I have. Yeah. Wow. Um, just to loosen them up. And a lot of the time in this movie, it just was, it happened to be that there was score or Justin playing live in our ears. And so, I'm, you know, that obviously takes it to a different place. Damien, can you speak to the number of shots that we see where your characters are in front of these beautiful, like, murals or, you know, gorgeous placards or posters, what kind of story are you telling with all of those? I mean, it was something that I've always loved about LA and wanted to celebrate and showcase a little bit was that it's such a, it's like the city full of signs, whether it's, you know, the Art Deco lettering on top of older LA buildings or billboards everywhere or, you know, old murals, you know, like one of my favorites is the mural that Emma walks by early in the movie of all uh, you know, which is in Hollywood, of all the old Hollywood stars um, sitting in a movie theater looking at you. Um, so it's a city that kind of comments on itself in its own art. So I really kind of wanted to, that just felt like something to definitely take a hold of and celebrate in this movie. Um, but then actually a lot, of the, a lot of the other kind of images in the movie, you know, like certain murals were done by our production design team, by David Wasco and his team. And, uh, you know, it would just be a case of we'd see like a big, blank white wall that Ryan was going to sip coffee in front of and 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 I would ask David you know it'd be really cool to have like a kind of old-fashioned orange ad like the way they did in the 20s when LA was all about orange groves and then David's team would mock it up and that's the mural that Ryan sits across from um, so we tried to do a lot of like both using what LA had to offer but also sometimes expanding on it as much as we could and trying to just make it as as richly kind of, yeah, painted a city as possible. Let me ask a couple final things. Emma, you recently did Cabaret on Broadway. Do you think that experience was necessary in, to give you the confidence to take on a film like this? <laughs> <laughs> Quick learner. Um, I, I think it was, I mean, it was absolutely so important. Damien and Justin came to see Cabaret while I was there in it and I didn't know that they were there. So it was my unofficial audition that I later got to freak out about because I had no idea they were watching that night. Um, and then I, yeah, it was, I think that that experience of doing something eight times a week um, for that long is obviously, if anything, just kind of stamina building. So going into rehearsal for this, I wasn't tap dancing or ballroom dancing in cabaret, but um, learning that was, you know, much more fun and I, probably felt like I was a little bit more remotely in shape uh, than I would have been before. Fred and I met on an airplane a couple of months ago. We were sitting next to each other. When I found out he produced La La Land, I was like, I just have to ask you one question. And it was about this whole idea of having to choose love or choosing to follow your dreams. And I think the movie has a lot of interesting things to say about it. Where do you guys all land on whether that's a necessary compromise or whether you can do both. Start with you, Fred. We'll go down the line. Well, I think what I said to you, I think we were drinking on that flight, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I think what I said is I don't think the movie's saying you have to make a choice. I don't think it's saying you have to have one or the other. Um, but I think there's a couple things that are really beautiful and moving about it to me. And I think the movie also, you know, the movie took a long time to make, and we started it before Whiplash was a thing, and the movie's very much about our struggles and our hustle to, to come here, and I think everyone along the way has first loves, but also has people who inspires them and are muses and 
who sort of sets them on a path to where we get to. And I think what I love about Sebastian and Mia is they wouldn't end up where they are without each other. And they'll never forget each other. And there's something perfect about something that's finite. And Damien says this very eloquently. And I remember when we first met him, there were three, you know, there was no script, there was no treatment. It was just jazz musician, actress, falling in love, trying to make it. And they don't end up together. They cannot end up together. Um, and there is, if you look at great love stories, they rarely end up together because there's something, you know, happily ever after means you gotta, you know, you gotta sort through real life. There's something kind of so perfect about Sebastian and Mia's story, um, both in the way they can remember it in that final montage, as well as what they provoked in each other and what they brought out in each other. Ryan was able to sort of have that club because of Mia. That's why, like, I start crying when I see that Seb sign every time, because that's her, you know? And I think the same is true of Mia's character, of believing the reason you sing in that scene is because Ryan tells you to be yourself, you know what I mean? Says, and allows you to trust in your voice. And so. I don't think it's about having to make that choice, just in this case, they didn't end up together, but their lives are richer because they knew each other. Uh, and that's ultimately, to me, what I take away about the, the sort of fusion and cohesion of love and our aspirations. Anybody want to add to that? I'm just going to pop in and say, I could not answer that better than yeah, Fred yeah, I, just now. I, I agree, know, whatever he said. Yeah. It's good by me. So let I me, wasn't listening, but I feel like yeah, it, was, it, sounded good. it was long and... It sounded good. Good job. Good job. Thanks. So I'm ending with the most important question. Emma, did you already know by heart all the words to I ran so far away by a flock of seagulls? Or did you have to study them for the film? Well, luckily, it was only really the first kind of uh, verse and chorus of I ran. So I had that down. Yeah, no, I had it down. I cannot congratulate the four of you enough. Emma Stone, Damien Chazelle, Justin, Fred, congratulations. You guys are an amazing audience. Thanks so much. Thanks to Airbnb and everyone who put this event together. Have a great night, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much, guys. Thank you.